Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to the uh, the first of a uh, um, of several um, campaign briefings that the Wellbeing South East Wellbeing Network is going to be doing this year. Um, we've actually got uh, uh, we've actually got lists of kind of we've got a list of the the campaigns that we're going to be promoting that some of you may have seen through um, our newsletter that's gone out. So what I'm going to do in the chat. I'm just going to pop in the chat a link to, if you haven't seen that already, there's a link I've just posted there, which is to the campaign briefing. So there's a couple of graphics in there that you can you can have, you can you can save, and you can see the, the campaigns when the campaign dates actually are. And then usually one month ahead of each campaign, we'll be doing the briefing. <clears throat> the other thing is the, the content for these briefings, uh, we've already had quite a few. We did actually do a request and we'll do it, do it every newsletter to ask people for each campaign briefing uh, is there content you want to bring forward so you might you might want to speak around a particular topic from a lived experience point of view you might have something in a service that you want to share that's that's relevant to that particular campaign you might be aware of a new resource that's available or some free training or whatever and so what we're doing is collecting from our well from the wellbeing network members which are nearly 900 strong now um, any content that people might want to want to include including themselves if they wanted to speak as part of each briefing so there's a second link i'm going to put in now as well which is if i can just find the the thing um and this link is actually to a, like an online form where you can actually submit content um for any any of the particular campaigns so on the form you'll see uh, like a list of the different campaigns um, and you'll see kind of the type of, uh, you can put your name in, you can put your contact details in and let us know what type of content you want to put in. And we'll get in touch with you and make sure that you're included as part of each um, each briefing. So I've just posted that link in the chat um, as well. So that's like a Google form that you can fill in and we'll get back in touch with you to chat more to you about each briefing. So we want to make them as, as inclusive as possible. We want them to be representative of our network membership uh, and obviously as diverse as, as the wisdom and sort of knowledge that exists across our, our network as well. So today is uh, the briefing at sort of one month ahead of um, International Day of Happiness. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to take, if I just flick onto the next screen, what you're going to see. Uh, let me just get that sorted a sec. OK. So uh, the actual, obviously, today is a briefing from 12 till 12.30 ish, probably about half an hour from now, really. Um, and then there's space, there's time afterwards to have a bit of a, a question and answer session. If there's any particular questions that, that crop up, if you just save them to the end, but mainly a discussion as well. So maybe we can have a chat about how people might be using uh, the resources, any particular ideas you've got. Maybe you've got plans already and we can, the Wellbeing Network can help you share those as well. So those of you who, who don't know me, I'm Richie Andrew. I work in Public Health South Tees um, in the mental health team. And we launched the South Tees Wellbeing Network on uh, 4th of May 2022. So this is, we're, we're approaching our two years of the Wellbeing Network and nearly a thousand members, we hope, by the time we get to that, that mark. So we continue to grow and kind of uh, develop our offer. And the campaign briefings are something that was, was asked for. Um, traditionally, you know, in the 20 years I've been working in health improvement and public health, campaigns have often been like a last minute thing. And so we wanted to do, this is why we do the briefings like a month ahead um, and no longer than that, because usually a lot of the campaigns haven't really released the details of that, that campaign that year. And so it gives us time to sort of prepare something um, and give us all a chance to sort of breathe and think about what we might like to do for that campaign as well. Today I'm joined by, uh, we're joined by Dr. Catherine O'Neill, um, or Kat O'Neill as, as, as she's known, to, uh, from Teesside University. Um, who's going to do a sort of 10, 15 minute presentation around practical kind of well-being tips and also talk about the, the peer support resource, which is available, um, which is going to be, it's just open for constant, like for any feedback at the moment in its final draft. And that'll be getting designed up and made available in a sort of like a full colour format as a resource that, that was developed with uh, loads of different peer supporters a couple of years ago. So that's like the culmination of a really decent project that happened um, that Kat supported us on one of many as well. And Kat's also helping us organise uh, our next uh, major event through the Wellbeing Network, which is on the 11th of April, which I can definitely uh, share it officially now. We'll be putting out a call to action um, this week about that. And that is an event which is called um, the working title. I think the final title actually is Wellbeing Alternatives to the medicalization of human distress. And really what that's about is, is trying to rebalance uh, the, the, the problem we've got is that 
men's health is often medicalized. It's not often looked at in terms of all the alternative elements that, that come into it. Um, huge part of that is, is people who are often referred to mental health services and maybe wouldn't benefit from therapies or, or medication, for example. What they really need is, is support, practical support with lots of other stresses that are going on in their life. And so we do over medicalize uh, the mental health and we're just about trying to rebalance that. Not saying there isn't a place for the medical uh, model, that's for sure. That's a very important area aspect of mental health support, but it's actually what else is out there that can sit in parallel to that or as an alternative to it as well. So if you're interested in that area, which most of our members were, it was the, it was the highest voted topic. Um, so that's exciting. That's coming up at Teesside University on the 11th of April, and we'll be putting out um, like an opportunity to book onto that quite soon. So we'll push on with today. Um, here's what I'm going to sort of be covering. So I'll just tell you about, you know, what what is the day all about? How did it come about? What's the aims of it? Um, what's the theme for this year? Um, the main campaign that is attached to the, the overall campaign, the movement of Action for Happiness and the different types of resources that is available from, from there. And also um, a 30 minute wellbeing workshop um, that I sort of, it's a modification of a, a workshop I delivered recently to some apprentices uh, that was really well received and the feedback was really positive. So that's sort of wrapped around some sort of uh, practical wellbeing um, uh, sort of approaches that you can build into your own daily sort of habits. Um, anyway, and that's that's a resource that we're going to circulate onto everyone and make available through the website that you can use on, you know, you can use whenever you want, really. But if you want to use it during uh, International World Happiness Day, then um, you can do. And I, it's something that you don't need to have, be particularly, you know, trained in. It's a very straightforward um, uh, toolkit that you can use and we would encourage you to do it. But you might, if you've got any questions on that, on the on the content and there you can get in touch with me afterwards that's absolutely fine and then there's a couple of slides as well around useful resources now before i go any further i just want to say that um that you don't need to take any notes today we'll be sharing the the the, uh, the powerpoint in like pdf form with all the links that are live so you can just sit back you can just relax and just take the information in um that we've put together for you so let's push on so I've put a couple of links on there uh, quite uh, right across. So the dayofhappiness.net is the, the website for the International Day of Happiness. And on there, you'll find several different resources. One of the things it'll do is link to the Action for Happiness campaign, which is an international movement campaign led, led in the UK. Um, and actually, that's we'll come to that in just a second, a bit more detail. So the actual date for the event is March 20th uh, this year. And on that day, the which as is tradition, the World Happiness Report, the annual World Happiness Report will be released. Um, and they've put a link there to the 2023 um, Happiness Report as well. So International Day of Happiness, this is the United Nations International Day of Happiness coordinated by Action for Happiness, a non-profit movement of people from 160 countries supported by a partnership of like-minded organizations. So what's it all about? Basically what we've seen across the world is a bit of a profound shift uh, in attitudes um, that's been underway, the, the attitude towards uh, happiness and towards well-being, the definition of well-being. I think people are now recognizing that, that, that progress uh, it should be about increasing human happiness and well-being, not just growing the economy. Um, and in the UK, one of the things that marked that was in 2011, the Office of National Statistics started gathering data on the what's called the ONS Wellbeing Four, uh, which is four sort of measures of happiness, doing sort of collecting population statistics around uh, well-being measures. And that's something that we've started to do annually now as well um, and developments in, in sort of the evidence over the last 30 plus years of positive psychology the factors that can affect well-being the actions that we can take individually uh, and as a community and as a population um, but also includes those, those sort of many small and easy daily habits that can have a very profound effect on our interactions with each other our life life satisfaction and even as we now know create new neural pathways in the brain to orient ourselves in a more positive way and actually a couple of techniques i'm going to describe today and that kat will uh, will, will describe in her presentation do exactly that as well so march 20th was uh, established as the an annual international day of happiness and all 193 united nation member states have adopted a resolution calling for happiness to be given greater priority in 2011 the un general assembly adopted a resolution which recognized happiness as a fundamental human goal and called for a more inclusive equitable and balanced approach to economic growth that promotes the happiness and well-being of all peoples they had the first un conference in 2012 um, 
And the UN General Assembly at that point adopted that resolution and decreed that the International Day of Happiness will be observed every year on the 20th of March. Um, and it was celebrated for the first time in 2013. So this is obviously the, the 11th year of, of that and, and the publication of the World Happiness Report. You might be thinking, well, one of the things that the World Happiness Report publishes every year, which the media tends to jump on on the day, is the happiest countries in the world. Um, where would the UK fare? Well, we just we actually have slipped in the last year. We slipped down the table. I think it was two steps from 17th to 19th. So we currently about the 193 UN members. We stand 19th, which is pretty good, I would say. You know, it's not bad at all. And I think um, for all the kind of frustrations we have, whether it's politically or, or the, the cost of living and the different crises that we've we've faced personally in this country um, over the last uh, even, let's say, 15 years, whether it's mainly financial and obviously the health with the pandemic, we've still found ourselves in the top 20. Um, we're still like one of the best countries in the world to live in, which I'm sure doesn't come as a surprise to many people. Uh, the US, the USA is in 15th ahead of us, Ireland in 14th. And then you have at the very top, you have Iceland, Denmark and Finley, Finland, respectively in third, second and first, which is um, an interesting aspect. But one of the things I sort of noted from a, a, an article in one of the broadsheets, I think it was The Guardian, when they were talking about Finland, Finnish culture, was that the fin Finnish have several um, different sayings for uh, lowering your expectations, basically. So perhaps actually not not having high expectations is one of the things that actually leads to a happier nation. So it could be a cultural aspect to that as well. So there's, as I said, there's, there's the links for you, the Day of Happiness, the World Happiness Report, um, and the, the link there to the main website and last year's report if you want to take a look. So what is the theme this year for 2024? Well, the theme is happier together. So, um, and as they say, at this time of uncertainty and conflict, this year's happier together theme reminds us that lasting happiness comes from feeling connected to others and being part of something bigger. In fact, um, as they say in their uh, 10 Keys to Happiness guidebook, that our relationships with other people are the most important thing for our happiness. So it's, a, it's the greatest indicator, the driver of happiness is our relationships with other people, which isn't a surprise when we see people presenting at crisis and we see people presenting with mental health problems often breakdown of relationships relationship um breakup with from partners is often cited as one of the most common causes but particularly for men as well so people with strong relationships are happier they're healthier and they actually live longer our close relationships with family and friends provide love they give us meaning they give us support and increase our feelings of self-worth our broader social networks bring a sense of belonging. So being part of something bigger and ultimately finding your tribe is great for our well-being. It's vital then that we take action to strengthen our relationships and make new connections. Action for Happiness ask you to ask yourself this question. And this, the question is this, what helps you stay close to the people that really matter? And you could break that sentence down, can't you, in terms of how do you stay close? So it's personally, is it about just staying in touch by making phone calls is it visiting people you know or is it actually those people that really matter that part of the sentence who are those people that really matter the people that share our, your values your personal values your sort of rules if you like you have in life the the likes the loves you have in life the activities you like to do and it's really simple to take you know is that rule is to surround yourself with people who have your best interests at heart and enjoy you know the things that you do too look for me personally like uh Nearly 10 years ago, I found triathlon. Um, a friend of mine suggested that I could get into that as a sport and a red car triathlon club was setting up at the time. And what I've found is we, I've been very sort of involved in developing that club and I've found really like loads of meaning in there. We do social activities together. We're obviously into the similar types of sports. And for me personally, the, I gravitate to smaller groups within that club who have some of the other values that I have as well and have developed new friendships as a result of that. And these, these have become some of the best friendships I've ever had in my life. So actually finding activities that you enjoy, it is about going on your own journey. And it is about kind of what, what we find is actually finding what works for you. And that's where the message is about well-being, about me mental health, particularly when it comes to kind of the clinical model, aren't always appropriate because we tend to try and fit everyone into the same box. And that's really a mistake that we make. Um, we need to sort of look at, look at ourselves, really, and kind of what it is that works for us. And there's a great quote for you. People will forget what you said. People will forget what you did. But people will never forget how you made them feel. 
And so this is a this this image here is taken from the the 10 keys to happiness guidebook, which I'm going to be sharing with you in, in the resource kit afterwards. Um, and so make time, make more time for the people that matter. Make three extra connections today. Often it's small things that can make quite a big difference. It don't have to be big. People often think big and just smiling at someone, getting a smile back or whatever it can be, can be some of the simplest things we can do. As well. Um, OK, so. Action for Happiness, if you're not familiar with Action for Happiness, it is a fantastic, powerful campaign, evidence based, um, which is just doing so much, creating so much content, it's hard to keep up, to be honest. But the good thing about the content they do, for example, I've, I've got on the screen there some of the, the webinars that they do, which are free to access. They do invite donations if you really enjoyed them as well, um, but can, can be actually accessed for their recordings afterwards. So like today's briefing, they put them online so you can benefit from them and all the different topics that they cover. So how do you, you know, if you're if you struggling with self-esteem, for example, how you, you see yourself in relationship to others, there's a, there's a, a Dr. Laura Park there did a talk about motivation and self-worth. There's another one recently which is really interesting about what is manifestation, how does it work, and the, all the science and evidence around manifestation as well. Um, so actually, you know, setting goals and actually how your brain will then notice the things that are going to help you on your way to your goal and how you put information out there to other people about trying to achieve your goals and what will come back to you in terms of what will manifest in your life as a result of putting your intentions out there. And it's a real it's a real science, some interesting stuff around that. So on the Action for Happiness site, you'll find on that that page at the bottom 10 day um, on the sorry, on the international uh, campaign website you'll find loads of different useful resources on action for happiness so you've got join the community you can sign up and get regular emails um, about all the different activities they're doing and how to interact with the campaign i encourage all of you to do that and with you you know when you when you circulate this information with your colleagues encourage them to do the same loads of different free resources and they've got a whole page dedicated to that from videos downloadable printable resources running workshops the the guidebook their monthly happiness calendar. So we publish this and we publish at the very bottom of our monthly newsletter, the link to each each month's um, happiness calendar. And basically what that is, is it's something you can do, an action you can do every single day, very small, very easy, that contributes towards your well-being. And some of those you will find will work for you, some maybe not, and some will become part of your daily habits if you practice that regularly as well. Um, there's actually a program you can sign up to online, which is free, 10 days of happiness online coaching. And that's something which is slightly personalized to you, given on your, given your choices. And then you get 10 days of emails and useful information and links to you personally based on your on your coaching needs, basically. So that's a really good uh, interactive resource that you can access. I mentioned there about the 10 keys guidebook, um, which explains what the 10 keys of happiness are, which I'm going to come to just in a little bit. And then there's an app as well where you can chat to other people who are members of the campaign and you get the you know various other the things that can be shared on there so it's just there's loads to get in, involved with what i've done is i'm going to very very briefly show you the the slides from the mini well-being workshop that, uh, that i put together that i described earlier on you need to allocate about 30 to 45 minutes to do this depending on if you include the discussions as part of it what i'm going to do is circulate um, a powerpoint and a pdf version of that which is just the slides from the workshop um, and it's very straightforward to, to use really so you don't have to be trained in mental health to do this it's really it's it's guided and it's it's safe and it's self it's kind of self-contained really so you, you can use this present use it from this presentation but if you want to run it as a, as a dedicated presentation we're going to give you it in those slide form as well so this is really what it looks like there's an element there and there's, it's actually accompanied by um an activity sheet. Let me just bring that up so you can quickly see it. I'll just drag this across. Hopefully this, if I'm sharing my screen in the right way, you should be able to see this. So this is an activity uh, activity sheets that we accompany with, with this. So you've got uh, people are asked to rank where they fit within um, life satisfaction, basically, or how they rank where they, where, how they feel about how worthwhile uh, the things in the life are. How, the, how happy they felt yesterday and then rank on not where well, not at all anxious and 10 ways completely anxious um, and then actually this is a question they would type that number in they'd or write that number into the activity sheet and then ask themselves why now this is quite interesting because straight away what you're asking people to do if they haven't ranked themselves very highly identify the things that are difficult for them in their life so it's, it's worth bearing in mind that there's a safety warning that goes along with this so by writing these things down it can 
you're really shining a torchlight on often parts of people's lives that they tend to ignore uh, or tend to set aside because they're quite difficult. Um, and the question is, is if people haven't done this, it can be quite difficult. And I've seen in, in the group this did happen. Um, and I was able to support this person and actually had a really positive conversation with them about, well, what's going on? What type of support are you having? And that's where it can be quite powerful as well uh, to do. Um, the next element on here um, is is the, um, let's bear with me is a conversation. What do you do personally that makes you happy and is good for your mental well-being? So it's just an open uh, discussion that you can have with a bit of an interactive chat with the group if you're delivering this in a workplace, for example, and just find out what do people do that they're conscious of, which is particularly about keeping their good well-being. So for me, it's about obviously swim, swim bike, run, connecting with friends, like-minded individuals, reading, PlayStation, watching films, whatever it might be. All these sort of, you know, what is your What's the code that you, you you live by that really helps you with your well-being? Some people may never have asked themselves that question, so it can be quite an interesting one. The next bit is to introduce people to the great dream. And the great dream are the 10 keys to happy living. The first five are based on what you might be familiar with as, as the five uh, five ways to well-being. And what what the uh, the Action for Happiness campaign did is is uh, looks at the evidence and then f went further than the five keys to well, uh, five ways to well-being and maxed it out really in terms of what the evidence tells us are the things that we can do in our life. So this is about um, in the work in the worksheet what you're asked to do is write down one thing that each person has done uh, for each key. So what have they done to do things for others? What they've done to connect with people? Um, and I think we ask for that in the you know in their recent life. How, what have they done recently? And then ask to ask them to rate if they can remember how they felt before they did that and how they felt after they did the activity. So we can start to make those connections in the brain between the activities that people do and then creating a relationship with the fact that it makes them feel good. And that actually strengthens those neural pathways in the brain and relates the activity to, I need to do this. This is a strategy that I have to make me, to make me feel better as well. And that's the uh, the great dream. So um, you can take more of a look at this within, within the guidebook that I'm going to uh, provide. I've included in that you don't have to use this, but um, I have there's loads of different grounding techniques that people can use. A really simple one is to stick your tongue to the roof of your mouth between behind your teeth. And actually, that's a very powerful technique. It's very, very simple. Just if you just try it now, just put your tongue behind your teeth and just push push up. You'll find actually it has an instant sort of grounding effect for most people. There's other things like breath work. There's the five, four, three, two, one, five things you can see in a room, uh, five, four things you can touch, three things you can sit, uh, you can you can. Uh, you can uh, uh, smell, hear, all that kind of thing. And then there's breath work, which is really powerful. And this is something that, you know, <laughs> you can joke with a group and say, presumably everyone in this room likes to breathe because people sometimes get uncomfortable with breath work. And what I've included here is a new one, which is which has got research behind it called the physiological sigh. Uh, and there's uh, there's three different videos around that. Uh, and the, what, the third link at the bottom is the science behind it and how it actually works and what chap what happens. I put some notes in the in the presentation to say if people have, um, people are people can be invited to take part in it. You can run it. There's a, a self guided video with two videos I've got on there as well to use. If people are feeling stressed, this is one of the most effective ways to immediately calm. Just doing two or three rounds of quick quick breathing, which can take less than 20 se less than 20 seconds, can actually help to reduce that that stress very in a very powerful way. If anyone struggles to, with nose breathing, you can use the mouth. If anyone's got any cardiovascular or respiratory issues, just let them let them know they can take it at their own pace or use shallower breathing. And if anyone feels dizzy, numbness or um, is uncomfortable, they can just return to normal breathing. But it is it is up to them to take responsibility for like, you know, reading their own body reaction. And then there's a the third activity, which is three good things activity. So this is from a research that was, I think, originated in America uh, with Martin Seligman, who's sort of regarded as the sort of the godfather of sort of well-being and the positive psychology. And the three good things activity was in, in his book, it was research, I think, with 20,000 uh, US soldiers. And what you do is you write down at the end of the day, you write down three things that have gone well in the last 24 hours. And then you actually write down why they went well. And so someone on, when I did the, um, the technique recently, I did this activity. Someone said, I've got a, the thing, the one good thing, I, one good thing I wrote down was I've got a fridge full of food. And they got the message straight away. And the reason why that was is because they had a job. They'd worked hard to get into that position. Um, they actually had enough money to be able to put food on the table, basically, and they were grateful for that. So that was actually, it is actually a, a practice that is about boosting gratitude. And it's been proven that it actually creates new pathways in the brain that 
seeks and sees more positives and helps to rebalance the natural more negative problem seeing uh, thinking as well. So it's a really great task. You can all try that starting tonight and it's a really positive task to use. And then at the bottom of that activity sheet is something called the takeaway task. So this is uh, not the takeaway you're thinking of. This is about um, like a key to happiness sort of takeaway. So take the 10, in, 10 keys to happiness. Often often people had gaps in that they hadn't thought about all the 10 areas. So it's trying to look at setting some goals for some of those um, areas of the 10 keys that you haven't taken any actions on and do that over the next month as well. So very light touch, very easy to do, very comfortable for most people and no one has to take part in any part of it when you're delivering it, it's up to them really. So that's that, that's that, um, that's that workshop, that 30, 30 to sort of 45 minute workshop um, that you can do. So some other useful resources, as I said, I'm going to share these slides. So your well-being, um, obviously be, most of you I would imagine we'll be familiar with the South Seas Wellbeing Network website. There's a part of there called part on there called Your Wellbeing. The website is going to be going. We've we've actually had a change of brand. If you look at the top left of the screen at the moment, you'll see our new brand, our new logo uh, for the South Seas Wellbeing Network. We've been through a whole process to redesign, and the website is going to be getting an overhaul over a weekend at some point in the next four to six weeks. Um, and you'll see a redesign for the website. So some of the links. Uh, to your well-being might move around so you might need to re-navigate uh, in a couple months time to find these things but they'll be there and clearer so we've got a journaling program that we've recommissioned for this year so we'll have some new dates coming out for that that's three two-hour workshops i think some of you familiar names in the room in, in in today have taken part in that and it's evaluated very well so that's with a guy called called joe uh, who leads that those, those workshops for us and you actually get given a free journal um, which has been custom designed with Joe and with members of the network to make sure that it's really what people want and need locally. Um, we've got free wellbeing taste sessions. We've got four more that we're going to be, there's another one happening uh, in March, which you can, there's still some places left on it, which is a full day. You can book on the morning or afternoon or both for like a wellbeing retreat day in, in Skelton. Uh, we've got four more of those that can be happening throughout 2024. And then we've got a new program, which is going to involve 30 to 40 people, some some of whom work in the system, some of who are sort of change ready, who are making use of services to take part in this sort of six month program. We're sort of calling at the moment Heroes Journey. And be, you'll hear more about that. If you haven't signed up to the network already, sign up to the network. You'll hear about that. And it's it's very much about personal growth, about people who might be ex regular experience stress, regular experience anxiety or even feel depressed sometimes. And actually know that they need to go on a bit of a journey um, to grow that, you know, push their comfort zone slowly, comfortably, but actually do, you know, go on that growth, that growth journey. So we're going to invite people to join us on that pilot and see how that goes this year. Books for Wellbeing, you can link to that. If you uh, if you sign up to either Redcar or Middlesbrough Libraries, you can access Books for Wellbeing. We purchased 2022's. Um, bestsellers for well-being, which include Gabor Mate's Myth of Normal about all to do with um, to do with uh, trauma and how that affects our body physically and how it affects our mental health and our behaviour. Um, and there's loads of other really good well-being books. You get they're in print form, they're in ebook form or audio book. And both ebook and audio book can access, be accessed by downloading an app called BorrowBox, using your login details for the libraries, and then you can just book them out. And they're free to access. So books that you might be interested in buying, you can access for free. Load of links at the bottom there for what is well-being um, and some other useful links, um, useful sort of approaches. Whoop my life is but when you've got a problem and you're struggling to solve it. It asks you questions in a certain way, very quickly, three key questions that start to uncover a solution for you. So if, you, if you've if you got a particular problem, you can test it out with Whoop My Life. And it's very carefully worded questions that explore that. It's really quite clever. And this is all different websites that link to loads of different science practices, different types of workshops that you can do and self-help. This great stuff, we're all evidence-based. And then my last, my last slide, uh, Every Mind Matters, which is the, the NHS, uh, the first NHS and the biggest campaign the NHS have ever promoted, which is all about self-care and self-help, really, when it comes to mental well-being, because we recognise that, you know, mental health is, for the vast majority of people, is something that presents when well-being has gone uh, or chronic stress has gone unaddressed. And so we all stand to benefit from having better, better, better mental well-being. So there's a free mind plan that you can do on their personalized mind plan. They'll send you emails and information around that and then loads of mental well-being tips on there as well that you can explore. And then as usual, there's um, on our website, you'll find lots of different useful resources. If people do need to access services beyond this type of support, finding the right services has got all the local key directories on there. 
And one of the things we are going to be organising quite soon is a virtual event like this, where, where we invite the leads of each of those directories to come on and talk about um, each of their directories, what type of features they've got, talk about the virtues of each directory and how you can register your data, you know, your services on them, how you can make use of them in different ways. So that's me. Um, that's the that sort of finishes my part of the presentation. And looking at the time, I'm going to hand over to uh, Kat O'Neill. Do you want to come on, Kat, and I'll lead you through the slides. Thanks, Richie. <laughs> so you're going to do the clicking? Yes. Are you going to do the uh, next slide, please? Next you know? slide, please. Yeah. yeah. OK, thank you. Um, that was great, Richie. I think I really love the idea of having these briefings like a month before the actual event, because it gives people those really practical things that they can put in place with people they're working with or others. I think I'm going to nick your 30 minute well-being activity and see if we want to do some with the students like in a month's time. So okay. it's a really thank good you. idea. Very kind um, of you. Thank you. No, it is. It's good. So, so hi everybody. My name's Kat O'Neill. I'm a clinical psychologist, and I'm, I work at Teesside University, mainly in a role that's around building partnerships with our external um, colleagues in different organisations and looking at how we get knowledge outside the university and into communities and also bring communities knowledge into universities. So I'm really interested in that knowledge exchange dimension. So we're going to fairly briefly talk through some practical well-being tips. Next slide, please. And what this is based on is a project that we, we've kind of spent like a few years on now. Um, my background is I'm from, from the voluntary sector myself. I worked in a lived experience organisation for five years and I'm really passionate about people with lived experience being involved in um, service development and service delivery. And so when this opportunity came came along to kind of look at the emotional well-being of people who work in those services with lived experience, it just seemed like a really good fit. Um, and we know that, you know, for any of us working in frontline services now, it just I don't know about you guys, but it just feels like the pace of life is so, so fast. Um, and especially if you're bringing your lived experience to work, it can um, be quite demanding and take its toll. So so what we did was um, in partnership with South Tees Public Health, with um, the Wellbeing Network, we developed some training for um, peer supporters based on like focus groups and interviews with organisations and individuals who worked in those roles. Um, we also did a really nice photo elicitation project, which is basically we give some peer supporters um, a ca some cameras. We give them some training on how to use the cameras and then we give them a month to go out and take photos of things that represented well-being to them and then got them back in to discuss the photos. Um, and so like based on their their experiences, we've developed um, a workbook that's around emotional well-being and that has loads. I've taken some of the exercises from um, that workbook and I'll give you a link to um, at the work, the, the final draft of the workbook. We haven't graphically designed it yet, but we've just got all the text. So if anyone wants to have a little look at that, we'd really appreciate it. But it's got like more information in there. Next slide, please, Richie. So you might as well do them. So these are our next next slide, please. So as Richie said in his presentation, gratitude is one of the things that um, we know can create a sense of well-being in others. And it's so easy for our brains to kind of always think about the negative or, you know, be, be working from a stressed position. Um, and one of the ways. Oh. Sorry. <laughs> One of the ways we can um, retrain our brain is to deliberately look for more positive um, areas of life. Um, and so one of the ways we can do that is through practicing gratitude. So I think it was on a, a well-being um, talk that was done by Helen Bartram. I don't know if you guys know her, um, that said, put a reminder in your phone, um, you know, to think about things that you're grateful for, even just for two minutes. So every night at 10 o'clock, I get a message saying, what are you grateful for now? And it's just a nice way to kind of no matter what I'm doing, I can just refocus my mind and just think of one thing or two things that I think, actually, I'm grateful for this. Um, and, you know, that, so that's like a nice way you can build it into your day. Um, another way is to kind of look for times when others do things for you. So, you know, trying to look out for when you could say thank you to somebody, um, looking out for those opportunities, to, you know, for, for knowing that somebody else is, is nurturing you in some way, or even just a small thing like, you know, with serving you in a cafe or, you know, something holding a door open for you. As Richie said, it's about how you shift your mind to look 
look for these like positive elements in your life. And I guess the research suggests that that gratitude has two kind of main components. One is about the things we can be grateful for, like the guy that was saying he was grateful for having food in his fridge, but also noticing what other p things that other people do for us and our gratitude for them. Next slide, please. So with that in mind, one of the um, kind of activities that Martin Seligman, who's like the godfather of positive psychology said, um, was using a gratitude letter. So this is thinking about someone who's helped you in your life. Um, it could be a family member, a friend, a colleague, um, if you're in addiction services, a sponsor. Um, take time to write them a letter. Don't worry about punctuation or don't worry about, you know, spelling it right or anything like that. It's for you to get that felt sense of wanting to communicate something about what they've done for you, um, how it made you feel, how grateful for you are for it and, and how it's impacted you now. Um, you should aim for about one to two pages of writing. And um, I guess you could do it just for you as a way of kind of get, getting generating those feelings of gratitude and, and kind of focusing on where you've been nurtured and helped in the past. Or if you wanted to, you could read it to them. So some of the um, examples of this are where you might actually make it make a time to go and hand deliver it to them. Or you might share that with that person as a way of kind of connecting f further with that other person and letting them know. Um, but you don't have to do that. It might be that you want to write it to somebody else that you don't ever want to send. And that's fine, too. Next slide, please. So the, the other area that was um, highlighted in our research um, with our peer supporters, um, we called it the benefits of banter, um, but loads of them talked about like how important humour is, um, even when you're dealing with the most traumatic of circumstances, and particularly for those working in a lived experience role is like being able to have that kind of dark humour and um you know, really lightens the sting of some of the things that they might have experienced. So it also, you know, gives us endorphins and makes us feel good. And we feel closer to others when we laugh with them. And so um, one of the things we, we and that was something that they all said was really, really important about their role. Um, so one of the exercises is, as Richie was saying earlier, this is going to be very individual to you. We can't like I, I personally hate like laughter yoga workshops or those ideas of like enforced laughter, but that might work for some people. So it's really individual to what works for you. But I was listening to a podcast the other day called um, the Blind Boy podcast. I don't know if anyone um, listens to it on here, but it's really, really good. Um, and he talks a lot about mental health and well-being from his own ex um, experience and, it's, and sometimes covers quite unusual and, and humorous topics. But I remember I was like driving along listening to the podcast and I was actually laughing out loud while I was doing it. So find the things that make you laugh, that, that make, give you a, you know, a chuckle. It might be watching com comedy shows on YouTube. It could be watching a particular film. It could be hanging out with friends, that kind of thing. And try and build more of that into your routine. You know, is it that you could book in to go to a stand up show? There's lots of like amateur stand up I don't I don't necessarily think they'd always be good but it, you know it's something you could go to with friends um or if not you've you've got access to all those free um you know things that free resources that might be something that kind of um trigger that that happy um laughter okay next slide please so one of the other things that was uh, came through really strongly in our interviews with peer supporters was this idea of connecting with nature. And I think a lot of other well-being initiatives have found the same thing. Um, lots of them talked about, you know, we're so lucky living in this area, aren't we, that we've got the North Yorkshire Moors on our doorstep. We've got the sea. Um, and and but even like it doesn't even have to be as grand as that. Like one of the peer supporters talked about a bench that was near her house that overlooks a park. And she brought in a photo of that bench because to her that represented well-being, because sometimes like she couldn't get much further than the bench because she had family commitments or she wasn't feeling well enough to like go far. But just being able to get out of the house, sit on that bench take a moment for herself, look at the park, look at the changing seasons and things. That was 
um, really beneficial to her. So, you know, one of the exercises from um, transitionnetwork.org, I just said I'd reference them, is this idea of finding a sit spot and expanding your senses. So this, this is a bit like that lady with the bench. It's picking somewhere that's not too far away and where you feel comfortable sitting um, where you can be in nature of some kind. That'll be different for all of you, depending on where you live. But it could be just a local park. If you're lucky enough to live near the sea, it could be there. It's up to you, really. Go to this place regularly and put a timer on your phone for 10 to 20 minutes. And then, as Richard was saying earlier, it's like taking in the five senses. Let your senses expand to take in what you can see, smell, hear and touch. Um, we don't expect you to be like licking walls or like benches or anything, so you don't have to taste. Um, but yeah, just take take it all in um, in relation to your senses. Try and hear the furthest away sound, um, and also like notice how the environment around you changes over time. So if you're going to the same sit spot regularly across the year. Do you notice the changes in the seasons? Do you notice like how the leaves will change, how it feels to be there, like in terms of the temperature, etc. Um, so yeah, and really kind of put your your consciousness and yourself out in connecting with nature. Next slide, please. So there were just three of the exercises um, taken from um, the Emotional Wellbeing for Peer Supporters book. Um, if you want to read a bit more about it and you're interested in feeding back, I've put a link, I'll put a link in the chat now to um, our Microsoft form or you can use the QR code there if you want to. Um, that's got a link to the actual PDF of the booklet as well as a form if you wouldn't mind sparing like a couple of minutes just to let us know what you think of the content, if there's anything we could change in terms of the language the and or any ideas about how it should look um, when we get it designed, that would be much appreciated. We're, we're doing that until the end of Feb. Um, and there's a whole load of other exercises in there that are kind of based on what we know about the, uh, the you know, the best practice literature out there, but also the experiences of people in this um, this locality around what creates emotional well-being for them. There's a lot of stuff about going to see the borough, but I think that's like an emotional roller coaster, isn't it? Do you know what I mean? Sometimes it creates well-being, maybe not always. <laughs> So, yeah, so th thank you, everybody, for, um, for for listening. And, yeah, if you want to have a look at the resource, please feel free to do so. Thank there you, you go, Richie. Done. Fantastic. Very much, very grateful for your time um, and putting it, in, putting it in. And obviously all the work that you've done to support the work of the Wellbeing Network as well. It's great. Um, are you, are you just able to stick around while we just, uh, like, move to sort of a bit of a discussion? Is that OK? Yeah, yeah. yeah. Fantastic. Josh.